On this episode, we'll be going through some of the work of John Keats. Now this podcast gets its name from this next poem, Ode to a Nightingale. The mockingbird is the state bird of Mississippi. It's very southern, etc. So we're going to start with this one. Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past and leithwards had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot but being too happy in thine happiness that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious spot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep-delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and provincial song and sunburnt mirth, Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrine, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple-stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen, and with thee fade away into the forest dim, fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret. Here where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs, where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies, Where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs. Where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards, already with thee. Tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry face. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown, through virtuous glooms and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, But in embalmed darkness guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild, white hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid May's eldest child becoming musgroves, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves. Darkling I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death, called him soft names and many a mused rhyme, to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hunger generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the self-same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth, when sick for home she stood in tears amid the alien corn, the same that oft-times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas and fairy lands forlorn. 
forlorn. The very word is like a bell to roll me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceive an elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision? Or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? Bright star. Bright star. Would I were steadfast as thou art. Not in lone splendor hung aloft the night and watching with eternal lids apart like nature's patient, sleepless eremite. The moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's human shores, or gazing on the new-fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors. No. Yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast, to feel forever its soft fall and swell, awake forever in a sweet unrest, still, still to hear her tender taken breath, and so live ever, or else swoon to death. To Sleep O oh, soft embalmer of the still midnight, shutting with careful fingers and benign our gloom-pleased eyes, embowered from the light, enshaded in forgetfulness divine. O oh, soothest sleep, if so it please thee, close in the midst of this thine hymn my willing eyes, or wait the amen ere thy poppy throws around my bed its lulling charities. Then save me, or the past day will shine upon my pillow breeding many woes. Save me from curious conscience that still lords its strength for darkness, burrowing like a mole. Turn the key deftly in the old wards and seal the hushed casket of my soul. On the Grasshopper and Cricket The poetry of earth is never dead. When all the birds are faint with the hot sun and hide in the cooling trees, a voice will run from hedge to hedge about the new mown mead. That is the grasshopper's. He takes the lead in summer luxury. He has never done with his delights, for when tired out with fun, he rests at ease beneath some pleasant weed. The poetry of earth is ceasing never. On a lone winter evening, when the frost has wrought a silence, from the stove there shrills the cricket song, in warmth increasing ever, and seems to one in drowsiness half lost the grasshoppers among some grassy hills. Excerpt from Hyperion, Book One Deep in the shady sadness of a vale, far sunken from the healthy breath of morn, far from the fiery noon and eve's one star, sat gray-haired Saturn, quiet as a stone, still as the silence round about his lair, forest on forest hung about his head, like cloud on cloud. No stir of air was there, not so much life as on a summer's day robs not one light seed from the feather's grass, but where the dead leaf fell, there did it rest. A stream went voiceless by, still deadened more by reason of his fallen divinity, spreading a shade. 
The naiad mid her reeds pressed her cold finger closer to her lips. Along the margin sand large footmarks went, no further than to where his feet had strayed and slept there since. Upon the sodden ground his old right hand lay nerveless, listless, dead, unsceptered, and his realmless eyes were closed, while his bowed head seemed listening to the earth, his ancient mother for some comfort yet. It seemed no force could wake him from his place, but there came one who with a kindred hand touched his wide shoulders after bending low with reverence, though to one who knew it not. She was a goddess of the infant world. By her in stature the tall Amazon had stood a pygmy's height. She would have taken Achilles by the hair and bent his neck, or with a finger stayed Ixion's wheel. Her face was large as that of Memphian Sphinx, pedestaled happily in a palace court when sages looked to Egypt for their lore. But oh, how unlike marble was that face. How beautiful. If sorrow had not made sorrow more beautiful than beauty's self. There was a listening fear in her regard, as if calamity had but begun as if the vanward clouds of evil days had spent their malice and the sullen rear was with its stored thunder laboring up. One hand she pressed upon that aching spot where beats the human heart, as if just there, though an immortal, she felt cruel pain. The other upon Saturn's bended neck she laid, and to the level of his ear, leaning with parted lips, some words she spake in solemn tenor and deep organ tone. Some mourning words which in our feeble tongue would come in these like accents. Oh, how frail to that large utterance of the early gods. Saturn, look up. Though wherefore, poor old king, I have no comfort for thee, no, not one. I cannot say, O oh, wherefore sleepest thou? For heaven has parted from thee, and the earth knows thee not, thus afflicted for a god. An ocean, too, with all its solemn noise, has from thy scepter passed. And all the air is emptied of thine hoar majesty. Thy thunder, conscience of the new command, rumbles reluctant o'er our fallen house, and thy sharp lightning and unpractised hands scorches and burns our once serene domain. O oh, ache in time, O oh, moments big as years, all as ye pass swell out the monstrous truth and press it so upon our weary griefs that unbelief has not a space to breathe. Saturn, sleep on. O oh, thoughtless, why did I thus violate thy slumber's solitude? Why should I ope thy melancholy eyes? Saturn, sleep on, while at thy feet I weep. As when upon a truant summer night those green-robed senators of mighty woods, tall oaks, branch charmed by the earnest stars, dream and so dream all night without a stir, save from one gradual solitary gust which comes upon the silence and dies off as if the ebbing air had but one wave. So came these words and went, the while in tears she touched her fairy large forehead to the ground just where her fallen hair might be outspread, a soft and silken mat for Saturn's feet. One moon with alteration slow had shed her silver seasons for upon the night, and still these two were postured motionless, 
like natural sculpture in cathedral cavern. The frozen god still couchant on the earth and the sad goddess weeping at his feet. Until at length old Saturn lifted up his faded eyes and saw his kingdom gone. And all the gloom and sorrow of the place and that fair kneeling goddess and then spake as with a palsied tongue, and while his beard shook horrid with such aspen malady, O tender spouse of gold Hyperion, Thea, I feel thee ere I see thy face. Look up, and let me see our doom in it. Look up, and tell me if this feeble shape is Saturn's. Tell me if thou hearst the voice of Saturn. Tell me if this wrinkling brow, naked and bare of its great diadem, peers like the front of Saturn. Who had power to make me desolate? Whence came the strength? How was it nurtured to such bursting forth, which fate seemed strangled in my nervous grasp? But it is so, and I am smothered up and buried from all godlike exercise of influence benign on planets pale, of admonitions to the winds and seas, of peaceful sway above man's harvesting, and all those acts which Deity Supreme doth ease its heart of love in. I am gone away from my own bosom. I have left my strong identity, my real self, somewhere between the throne and where I sit here on this spot of earth search Thea search open thine eyes etern and sphere them round upon all space space starred and lorn of light space regioned with life air and barren void spaces of fire and all the yawn of hell Search, Thea, search, and tell me if thou seest a certain shape or shadow making thy way with wings or chariot fierce to repossess a heaven he lost erstwhile. It must, it must be ripe of progress. Saturn must be king. Yes, there must be a golden victory. There must be gods thrown down and trumpets blown, of trumpets calm, and hymns of festival upon the gold clouds metropolitan, voices of soft proclaim and silver stir of strings and hollow shells, and there shall be beautiful things made new for the surprise of the sky children. I will give command, Thea, 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 where is Saturn? This passion lifted him upon his feet and made his hands to struggle in the air. His druid locks to shake and ooze with sweat. His eyes to fever out. His voice to cease. He stood and heard not Thea's sobbing deep. A little time and then again he snatched utterance thus. But cannot I create? Cannot I form? Cannot I fashion forth another world, another universe to overbear and crumble this to naught? Where is another chaos? Where? That word found my way onto Olympus and made shake the rebel three. Thea was startled up, and in her bearing was a sort of hope as thus she quick-voiced spake, yet full of awe. This cheers our fallen house. Come to our friends, O Saturn. Come away and give them heart. I know the covert. From thence came I thither. Thus brief, then with beseeching eyes, she went with backward footing through the shade of space. He followed, and she turned to lead the way 
through aged boughs that yielded like the mist which eagles cleave up mountain from their nest. Meanwhile, in other realms, big tears were shed, more sorrow like to this and such like woe. Too huge for mortal tongue or pen of scribe, the titans fierce, self-hid or prison-bound, groaned for the old allegiance once more and listened in sharp pain for Saturn's voice. But one of the whole mammoth brood still kept his sovereignty and rule and majesty. Blazing Hyperion with his orbed fire still sat, still snuffed the incense, teeming up from man to the sun's god, yet unsecure. For as among us mortals, Omens drear, fright, and perplex, so also shuddered he. Not at dog's howl or gloom bird's hated screech or the familiar visiting of one upon the first toll of his passing bell or prophesying of the midnight lamp, but horrors portioned to a giant nerve oft made Hyperion ache. His palace bright bastioned with pyramids of glowing gold and touched with shade of bronzed obelisks glared a blood red through all its thousand courts, arches and domes and fiery galleries. And all its curtains of aurorian clouds flushed angrily while sometimes eagles' wings, unseen before by gods or wandering men, darkened the place, and the neighing steeds were heard, not heard before by gods or wandering men. Also, when he would taste the spicy wreaths of incense, breathed aloft from sacred hills, instead of sweets, his ample palate took savor of poisonous brass and metal sick. And so, when harbored in the sleepy west, after the full complexion of fair day, for rest divine upon exalted couch and slumber in the arms of melody, he'd pace away the pleasant hours of ease with stride colossal, on from hall to hall, while far within each aisle and deep recess his winged minions in close clusters stood, amazed and full of fear, like anxious men who on wide plains gather in panting troops when earthquakes jar their battlements and towers. Even now when Saturn roused from icy trance, went step for step with Thea through the woods, Hyperion, leaving twilight in the rear, came slope upon the threshold of the west. Then, as was wont, his palace door flew ope in smoothest silence, save what solemn tubes blown by the serious zephyrs gave of sweet and wandering sounds slow-breathed melodies. And like a rose in vermeil tint and shape, in fragrance soft and coolness to the eye, that inlet to severe magnificence stood full-blown, for the god to enter in. He entered, but he entered full of wrath. His flaming robes streamed out beyond his heels and gave a roar as if of earthly fire that scared away the meek ethereal hours and made their dove wings tremble. On he flared from stately nave to nave, from vault to vault, through bowers of fragrant and enwreathed light, and diamond-paved lustrous long arcades, until he reached the great main cupola. There standing fierce beneath, he stamped his foot, and from the basements deep to the high towers jarred his own golden region, and before the quavering thunder thereupon had ceased, his voice leaped out, despite of godlike curb to this result. O oh, dreams of day and night, O oh, monstrous forms, O oh, effigies of pain, 
O oh, specters busy in the cold, cold gloom, O oh, lank-eared phantoms of black-weeded pools, why do I know ye? Why have I seen ye? Why is my eternal essence thus distraught to see and to behold these horrors new? Saturn has fallen. Am I too to fall? Am I to leave this haven of my rest, this cradle of my glory, this soft climb, this calm luxuriance of blissful light, these crystalline pavilions and pure fanes of all my loosened empire? Is it left deserted, void, nor any haunt of mine? The blaze, the splendor, and the symmetry I cannot see, but darkness, death and darkness. Even here, into my center of repose, the shady visions come to domineer, and salt, and blind, and stifle up my pomp. Fall. No. By Tillis and her briny robes, over the fiery frontier of my realms I will advance. A terrible right arm shall scare that infant thunderer, rebel Jove, and bid old Saturn take his throne again. He spake and ceased, the while a heavier threat held struggle with his throat, but came not forth. For as in the theaters of crowded men, Hubbub increases more when they call out, Hush! So at Hyperion's words the phantoms pale bestirred themselves, Thrice horrible and cold, And from the mirrored level where he stood A mist arose, as from a scummy marsh. At this, through all his bulk, in agony crept gradual from feet unto the crown, like a lithe serpent, vast and muscular, making slow way with head and neck, convulsed from overstrained might. Released, he fled to the eastern gates, and full six dewy hours before the dawn in season dew should blush, he breathed fierce breath against the sleepy portals, cleared them of heavy vapors, burst them wide suddenly on the ocean's chilly streams. The planet orb of fire, whereon he rode each day from east to west, the heavens through, spun round in sable curtaining of clouds, nor therefore veiled quite, blindfold and hid, but ever and anon the glancing spheres, circles and arcs, and broad belting color, glowed through and wrought upon the muffling dark, sweet-shaped lightnings from the nadir deep up to the zenith, hieroglyphics old, which sages and keen-eyed astrologers, then living on the earth with laboring thought, won from the gaze of many centuries. Now lost, save what we find on remnants huge of stone or marble swart, their imports gone, their wisdom long since fled. Two wings this orb possessed for glory, two fair argent wings, ever exalted at the god's approach. And now, from forth the gloom, their plumes immense rose one by one, till all outspreaded were, while still the dazzling globe maintained eclipse, awaiting for Hyperion's command. Fain would he have commanded, fain took throne and bid the day again, if but for change. He might not. No, through a primeval god, the sacred seasons might not be disturbed. Therefore the operations of the dawn stayed in their birth, even as here, tis told, those silver wings expanded sisterly, eager to sail their orb, 
the porches wide opened upon the dusk dimenses of night, and the bright titan, frenzied with new woes, unused to bend by hard compulsion, bent his spirit to the sorrow of time. And all along a dismal rack of clouds, upon the boundaries of day and night, he stretched himself in grief and radiance faint. There as he lay, the heavens with its stars looked down on him with pity, and the voice of Colas from the universal space thus whispered low and solemn in his ear, O brightest of my children, dear earth-born and sky-engendered, son of mysteries, all unrevealed even to the powers which met at thy creating, at whose joys and palpitations sweet and pleasures soft, I, Colas, wonder how they came and whence, and at the fruits whereof what shapes they be, distinct and visible, symbols divine, manifestations of that beauteous life diffused, unseen throughout eternal space. Of these new formed art thou, O brightest child, of these thy brethren and the goddesses. There is sad feud among ye and rebellion of son against his sire. I saw him fall. I saw my firstborn tumbled from his throne. To me his arms were spread. To me his voice found way from forth the thunders round his head. Pale walks I, and in vapors hit my face. Art thou too near such doom? Vague fear there is, for I have seen my son's most unlike gods. Divine you were created, and divine in sad demeanor, solemn, undisturbed, unruffled, like high gods ye lived and ruled. Now I behold in you fear, hope, and wrath, actions of rage and passion, even as I see them on the mortal world beneath, in men who die, this is the grief, O son. Sad sign of ruin, sudden dismay and fall, yet do thou strive as thou art capable. As thou canst move about an evident God, and canst oppose to each malignant hour ethereal presence, I am but a voice. My life is but the life of winds and tides. No more than winds and tides can I avail, but thou canst. Be thou therefore in the van of circumstances. Yea, seize the arrow's barb before the tense string murmur to the earth. For there thou wilt find Saturn and his woes. Meanwhile, I will keep watch on thy bright sun, and of thy seasons be a careful nurse. Ere half this region whisper had come down, Hyperion arose and on the stars lifted his curved lids and kept them wide until it ceased. And still he kept them wide. And still they were the same bright, patient stars. Then, with a slow incline of his broad breast, like to a diver in the pearly seas, forward he stooped over the airy shore and plunged all noiseless into the deep night.